we have a recording. Please note that uh, our speaker will be recording the session so that people who are not here will be able to download it from his YouTube channel, I assume. If you do not want you to be seen on camera, you're more than welcome to stop your video. So with a, oh well, I better not say that. Um, I will now hand over to our special speaker today, Randall Edge, who will be talking about Robert's Rules in Action. Over to you, Randall. You have 25, 30, 35 for the timing of the speech, and then some time for questions and answers. Over to you. Thank you, Madam Chairman, fellow Toastmasters, most welcome guests. Today, we're going to be talking about parliamentary process. And specifically, we're going to be talking about the system that is widely used in North America. That is the Roberts Rules of Order system. Now, where do Robert rules come from? Well, this is actually a bit of a story that dates back, believe it or not, to the American Civil War. And there was a fellow who had a curious habit. He was an officer in the US Army and his hobby was to embroil himself in the local politics of the local community where he was stationed. And he was stationed all over the United States. And what he observed was that the rules and the way that things were done changed dramatically in each community that he was stationed. And he thought to himself, this needs to be improved upon. Now, there was one specific winter. He was winter stayed in the year of 1876. And he sat down and he did a lot of research. He went to the library in Congress. He wrote and got lots of documentation from the British Parliament. And he sat down and composed a set of rules to run meetings. And, and what's interesting about this is that he, when he had finished his, his work, he tried to get his document published. And there was no interest from anyone to publish his, his work. And so he decided to publish it himself. Then we took it to the publisher, an error was made. Because the publisher, when they published the book, published it with a cover saying Robert's Rules of Order. And it wasn't supposed to say that. It's supposed to say Manual of Rules of Order. But it stuck. And so, like it or not, um, this officer, Henry M. Roberts, uh, gave birth to Robert's Rules of Order. Now, I want to start by sharing with everyone that we're running meetings, running parliamentary process. It can be confusing because there are actually competing systems of parliamentary process. In Canada, many organizations use a system called Kerr and King, written by two university professors, but they're actually based upon the foundation of Robert's Rules. Robert's Rules is based on a foundation of what is used in the US Congress. US Congress uses a set of rules based on the foundation of rules that came from the British Parliament. So all these systems have a common foundation. And so once you are aware of how one system works, you can very quickly move over from one system to another. So this manual that was created basically organizes a methodology that can be used for running a meeting efficiently, and more specifically, a business meeting. A business meeting, to be frank, is one where we're talking about issues that involve money. When there's money, people get excited. Now we can run many, many meetings informally. We can run a meeting where we have within the context of that meeting, a business meeting that is uh, run by a parliamentary process. This is up to the organize, organizers of the organization. But it can be a very useful way 
of dealing with issues that may have an element of controversy involved. Whenever I look at an agenda of a meeting I'm asked to serve as a parliamentarian, I'm very, very focused upon which issues involve money, because invariably they're the ones that will need my undivided attention. Now there's some principles that have been laid out and the principles are votes of voting members are counted equally. There are rights inherent to those members that are absent. And this is something for the chairperson to keep in mind. All members have the right to free and fair debate. All members have the right to know the meaning and the possible significance of a proposal that is before them. And so this is something that is importantly given to the presiding officer. In parliamentary process, the majority has the right to make a decision. The minority have the right to be protected and the right to be free to speak and speak for their side of the issue. Most importantly, and I cannot stress this enough, there exists a shared duty, shared between the presiding officer, the meeting leader, and those in the assembly, those who are members who have the right to actively participate and vote in the parliamentary process. I cannot understate this enough. If you have a meeting leader who is strong in knowledge with parliamentary process, and you have an assembly of individuals who have no experience with parliamentary process, then unfortunate things will take place. And the inverse is true. If you have a meeting leader who is weak in the knowledge of parliamentary process, and they stand before an assembly of individuals who are experienced in parliamentary process, this is equally not a uh, best practice. So what we want to emphasize is there is a shared duty, not only from the presiding officer, but for those of the assembly to understand how parliamentary process operates. So let's talk about some basic definitions. First, there's a concept called a motion. A motion is a formal proposal for action. That's all it is. It is a proposal. And so the process is that the presiding officer calls for any individuals in the assembly to be recognized. Someone indicates that they wish to speak. The chair recognizes them, they rise, and they have the right to initiate a formal motion, a main motion, which is a formal proposal of some kind. The next definition I want to focus on is the presiding officer. Now using these words carefully because we live in different times in which we're really not um, wanting to attach any notion of a gender to a position, which is fair. The more impartial the leader of the meeting can be, the better. And so the best uh, phrase that I can identify is presiding officer. Now there, are traditional terms there's nothing wrong with using them but you know we live in a time where we're trying to not use them as much as we have in the past chairman mr chairman madam chairman you're still using a gender-based word man in 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 the words i always snicker at chairperson per son son that's a male gender why are we using Chairperson as a neutral um, identifier. I'm not sure why we do that. President, that's nice and neutral because you can have a Madam President, Mr. President, Madam Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair. I like these. But the best I, I find is the use of presiding officer and best practices. This is the leader of the meeting. The presiding officer is the leader. They're the traffic cop. Let me really focus on that a minute. They're 
the traffic cop. They direct traffic. The leader must maintain the respect of the assembled members or the assembly. So it doesn't matter what type of group you have, maybe with shareholders and maybe with condominium owners, it doesn't matter what type of group is involved. A good phrase for the group that is assembled is the assembly. Now, getting back to this traffic cop concept, I cannot emphasize this enough. Let's just think a moment for what it means to be a traffic cop. Imagine yourself directing traffic. So you stop and you're waving others to go through. Now, when you think about it, does a traffic cop stop then turn to someone in the corner and say, what should I do next? Traffic cop doesn't do that. Traffic cop stops traffic one way, directs traffic the other way. They don't call upon any assistance because they're directing traffic. It's their job to direct traffic. So when I witness a meeting leader turning to the secretary, can you read back the motion as it exists right now? Part of me, that's not being a traffic cop. The secretary's not in charge of the meeting. You are. It's your job. You instruct the secretary what goes into the record. Another very, very important principle. The meeting leader is the traffic cop. That is their job. So more definitions. Quorum. The minimum number of members to transact business. Now, I actually had today a joke. You know, it's not a milk toast type of joke. It's just a, a joke. And the joke that I have is, does it qualify as quorum if half of your participants slept through the meeting? What is the answer to that question? Quorum is very important because there has to be, and, and this is defined in the bylaws, the articles, the constitution of the organization in whatever form that exists, of how many people need to be present to constitute a legal meeting. And so the answer to my joke is, even though members have slept, thank you for participating today by being here to constitute quorum. So thank you for your, your role today. Thank you for your service. You may not have voted, you may not have uh, participated in debate, but you were here to constitute quorum. Now bylaws, in every organization, there are basic written rules. If you're an incorporated company, those, these are called articles of incorporation. If you're a Toastmasters club, for example, there is a club constitution which lays out how meetings should be run, how frequently they should be uh, conducted, how much notice needs to be sent in advance, what, in what form will that notice go? Can you send out notice by email? All these issues are defined in the bylaws. Whenever I take on a new assignment with any new organization, I ask for their bylaws. I ask for the meeting minutes for the last two meetings. And I study them carefully. And I study which system the bylaws have asked to be put in place. Sometimes it's Kerr and King, sometimes it's Robert's Rules, sometimes it's another system. There's another one called Gillian. There's all kinds of systems. And basically, these, are def they, these definitions are found in the bylaws for the organization. And to be an able to, uh, parliamentarian, to be an able parliamentarian, you need to be familiar with these rules. I'll never forget, I was uh, at the annual general meeting for the Association of uh, Paramedics. And the chairman was asked a question specifically that related to the bylaws. And because I was following along, and no matter what the discussion was, I was flipping back and forth continuously. I had t tabbed all the bylaws. The chairman turned to me, Mr. Parliamentarian, can you tell us which section of the bylaws uh, deal with this issue? And I instantly rose. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question. I was following along, and I actually have that section in front of me. You could, you could have heard so, you know, a little bit of gasps from the, from the assembly. And I said, it's under section 23, subsection one. And may I uh, read it out to you now? 
he said, please do. And I wrote it word for word, you know, stated it word for word. And it answered the question with absolute clarity because it was laid out in the bylaws. Now, something else that's very, very confusing is the concept of standing rules. Now, standing rules are individual practices that are created by the organization for itself. I don't know if anyone was watching the uh, finance committee this week for the standing committee um, examining Bill C-2 at the House of Commons. And it was a fascinating, fascinating meeting because there was point of orders flying around. And one of the points that was being made by an MP who had been serving on the committee for 13 years was they were speaking and challenging the chair about a convention, which was a standing rule. And the standing rule was that if a question is posed to a witness that lasts five seconds, the witness can only have five seconds to answer the question, can't go on and on and on for hours. And there's a big debate about this. And, and they called upon a professional who said, yes, that was a convention that's used by the committee of the whole, applies to all committees in the house. And so it had to apply to the circumstance and our, our finance minister had to limit their answer to five seconds under the convention for the committee, which was a standing rule. Now, when you have standing rules, I encourage that they're written down and so and circulate to everyone so everyone understands these standing rules that that exist. They can be problematic, but they're part of parliamentary process. And as a parliamentarian, we need to be aware of them when they are in place. A good example of a standing rule is, for example, if you're making a motion that is more than uh, 10 words in length, you must write it out in advance and have it given to the secretary at, uh, before you make the motion so the secretary has a fighting chance to get it into the record the way you want. That's not a bad standing rule. Nothing wrong with that. Now, first rule of the chair. First rule. And the one that's probably the least understood. The presiding officer can do anything they want. But, there's a big but there. The assembly has to consent to what they're doing. They're safest if they follow Robert's rules closely. And if they depart from Robert's rules, and what they do is really not in agreement with members of the assembly. The assembly has uh, counterbalance rights in the form of a motion to appeal the decision of the chair, which is very embarrassing for the chair because the chair is only working on the respect of the assembly. If a motion to appeal the decision of the chair or challenge the chair takes place, the motion is made, <clears throat> it is seconded, it is passed by the assembly, whatever decision the chair has made is reversed. Very embarrassing. Because the chair is a traffic cop who is working based on the respect of the assembly. So anyone in this role can take some liberties, but does so at the pleasure of the assembly. Now, I'll give you a good example. <clears throat> One very efficient way of doing things. Ladies and gentlemen, the minutes of the meeting have been circulated to everyone in the room. I trust everyone's had an opportunity to review them. Just going around the room, show of hands, is there anyone that feels that there should be any changes made to the minutes? Seeing no hands, I'm going to declare the minutes as adopted. And I'm going to ask the secretary to enter them in the record little pause, no motion to appeal, move on. And you can do that. You don't necessarily need a motion to approve the minutes. But as the chair, if you take this action, you do it at the leisure of the assembly. And so if you are a member of the assembly, this is where it's so important that people in the assembly know their rights. If you're not happy with the decision, Madam or Mr. Chair, 
respectfully, I'd like to see this handled as a motion point of order because I'd like to see a vote. Fair enough. We'll now proceed to accept the motion. Would you like to make a motion to adopt the minutes? There we are. So that interaction can take place. But the chair can do anything they want if they get away with it. That's the trick. The chair must be seen to be fair and impartial. The chair works at the leisure of the assembly. The chair is a traffic cop, not the recording secretary. The recording secretary enters into the record what they're instructed to enter by the chair. Presiding officer's duties, call them into order, establish that quorum has, has been taken place. One of the most important issues right away is confirming the agenda. Once the agenda is approved by the floor or declared by the chair, then major action has to take place to change the order of events, the amount of time allowed to events. An agenda with uh, timings on it is very important because if it's accepted, then those time limits become and uh, compulsory to, uh, to uh, for everyone to work with. There is a motion called orders of the day. And if the agenda, which was previously approved, says at three o'clock, we should be at item 16, but you're at item eight. If someone calls order of the chair, you must jump immediately to item 16, forget about item eight. So approving the agenda is an important matter. and adds to the efficiency of a meeting. The presiding officer is the person who recognizes members to speak. Unless there's standing rules limiting the amount of time a speaker can speak, which has been passed by the assembly in the past, once a person is recognized by the chair and has the floor, they have the floor. They can take as long as they want. And so these things have to be um, carefully uh, attended to one by one. And it's the chair whose responsibility is to state and put to a vote all questions that come before the assembly. If someone says, Mr. Chair, what are we voting for? I don't understand. Then there's been a real problem because the, the chair should be acting almost like an auctioneer, repeating and stating and explain the implications every step of the way. And we'll see that when we have a little bit of a practice meeting. So the presiding chair has got the job to protect the assembly. Um, they have the right not to recognize someone. They can enforce rules that have been set for debate. They can expedite business in an orderly fashion. They decide all questions of order, and that's what made yesterday's uh, session at the C2 um, Finance Committee so interesting, was that the chair, who seemed to be a relatively new person in the role, says, no, I realize there's a convention, but I'm the chair. I'm going to let the minister speak as long as they want. Go ahead. And no one, no one could speak against the fact because the chair deals with questions of order. Privilege is a different topic. We'll talk about that. And they're the ones that declare the meeting adjourned. So how do we go through parliamentary process? Well, fr frankly, what happens is there's a step-by-step -step process. So the chair opens the meeting and calls for anyone that wishes to be recognized. An individual is recognized and they are empowered to make a motion, which we call the main motion. The steps are, member obtains recognition from the presiding officer. The member makes a main motion. Now, a bit of a, a process here. For the member who's been recognized, they should understand that there's a little bit of political aspects to what they're doing. There's nothing wrong with having a preamble to sell the benefits of your proposal. 
Mr. Chair, I rise. I looked at the budget today and I see that we have a major price increase to all the condominium owners. I quite frankly can't personally afford a 15% increase. So I'd like to make a motion that uh, the budget be only increased a maximum of 5%. So I did it. I did a main motion, but I lobbied for it. And you're allowed to do that. And so anyone that just makes a motion is missing an opportunity to speak on behalf of their motion. Then the next part, the chair, ladies and gentlemen, we have a motion before the floor. The floor, the motion is that the budget be limited to a 5% increase. Is there a seconder for the motion? And why do we have a seconder? We have a seconder because we want to establish at least one other person in the room wants to talk about our topic. At least one. Now, on the other hand, I hear people stand up, I'll second it so we can discuss it. And that makes my blood boil because you're wasting all of our time. A motion that's made and there's no seconder is an efficient part of the parliamentary process. The motion fails on the floor. Good. It was frivolous. But someone who seconds for the sake of of us talking about it is saying, oh, I got lots of time, let's waste your time. I don't really understand what we're talking about, but let's just talk about it. That's ridiculous. So the seconder has a major role. Now, if you are an individual who has an issue and you want to advance it, nothing wrong with you lobbying a fellow member to second your motion in advance. There's nothing wrong with that. So at least one other person in the room wants to talk about the issue. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a motion on the floor. The motion is that we're going to accept um, a limit on our budget of 5%. The motion has been seconded. I'm now going to call upon the person who made the motion to speak on behalf of it. And so every step of the way, the presiding officer is letting everyone know what we're talking about. And the person who made the motion has a second opportunity to speak on half of it. Then the presiding officer once that person has finished, ladies and gentlemen, is there anyone that wants to speak before the motion? You're actually asking for a contrary point of view. So you're getting a, a debate going. It's really opening the floor for debate. Now, I have what I call the three down, three countdown rule. One Mississippi, two Mississippis, three Mississippis. Ladies and gentlemen, hearing no further discussion. Is there any further discussion? Are we ready for a vote? One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippis. I think we're ready for a vote. All in favor, please raise your left hand. All against, please raise your right hand. Now I do this so that it's physically different. You can clearly count the hands because, you know, and sometimes well, you got two hands up. They can't vote for two things at the same time. And the chairman then, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I declare the motion as failed. Then, the presiding officer turns to the secretary. Madam Secretary, please enter the record a motion that the budget was to be limited to 5% and that the motion failed. Now, some people enter everything that was said and who said what into the record. Have you ever looked at the business minute book of a corporation? None of that stuff is in there. Just the motions that were passed. That's it. That's all that needs to be in the record. So this is just a quick example of what I'm talking about. Now there is something called an amendment and I'm, I'm watching my time carefully, but I'm just going to go over my time because I'm allowed to a little bit. You can make a motion to amend the wording of a main motion, which is why we call it a main motion. And so for an example here, the motion to amend is that we want to change the word silly and insert the word very silly. Now a motion to amend. It needs a seconder, there's open debate, and you 
deal with the amendment first and work backwards to the main motion. Now, these are an area that cause enormous confusion. When I'm in the role of uh, being a uh, presiding officer, if I see more than three levels of amendments, um, I know for a fact that I am dealing with an issue that is incomprehensible to the assembly. And what I invariably do is stop everything, go back to the person who made the motion and ask them if they're willing to reword uh, the motion. Then we have to go back to every person that made and seconded the amendments going backwards, get all their consent to withdraw the motion and then put a fresh new motion on the floor that everyone understands. Invariably, that works very well. But I'm here to say, once you're beyond three layers of amendments, the average human being cannot keep track of what we're talking about. It's just incomprehensible. And so that's to be avoided. There are ways to end debate, some tricks of the trade, if you will, refer to a committee, which means you just send the issue away and have it studied and brought back at another time. Motion to postpone, which means um, you're, you're going to deal with it sometime in the future. Maybe you're keyed on a certain event. There's a motion called to postpone indefinitely, which means it goes away, never comes back. Bye bye. And these are issues in which, you know, it's very controversial, it'll tear the organization apart. And, you know, if someone wins, no one wins, right? That, that kind of idea. So as a result, um, postpone to an, uh, motion to postpone indefinitely is a very clever way of just getting that issue off the table. And of course, the number one tactical tool, motion to adjourn, which the meeting is over, whatever we're talking about, doesn't matter anymore because we've ended debate. Challenge the chair, motion to appeal the decision of the chair. Um, I, I Sometimes I have great fun doing this, and sometimes it's just a quiet signal to the presiding officer. I think we're going a little too far here. And it's a polite signal to send to the chair, you know, um, I'm, I, I'm going to pursue it the contrary view um, now that you've made a ruling. And so it's, it's, it's a balancing portion to the chair and very embarrassing to the chair. So one that you need to be careful with. Sometimes point of information where you're passing information to the chair as a polite way of saying, you know, I, I'm not totally in agreement with what you're doing. Point of order. Point of orders can be very, very interesting, especially if you have standing rules that you're bringing to the attention of the chair, that type of thing. We can vote all kinds of different ways. We can vote by show of hands, a roll call, general consent, by dividing the audience, by written ballot. All these are val valid ways of voting. So we have main motions. And we have subsidiary motions. I've talked about the motion to amend, call the question, motion to table the bill or postpone indefinitely, postpone to a specific event in time, refer to a committee, or limit or extend limits on debate, which can create a standing rule. It, 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 they have this a lot in the House of Commons. You can only pose a question um, in five minutes and you can only respond in five minutes very very interesting approach um, so that the order of you know the business of the committee can carry on there are things which are called privilege motions orders of the day you must go straight to that portion of the agenda that you're at question of privilege now uh, fellow able toastmaster and parliamentarian laura winger and i actually have done a special session on this issue and most specifically, the way one of the committees was operating in the House of Commons. Very, very, very interesting, where questions of privilege were, were flying about. And most of them were related to the dealing with technology and the limits it was placing on the activities of members to do their job. And, you know, it, it's a matter of the highest importance. And in the past, it's been things like, you know, the room's too hot, I can't breathe, you know, a question of privilege is affecting me. But now, with, the, with all the focus we have with tools like Zoom, this is a very valid area for question of privilege. 
I've heard several people talk about district council meetings and that was biting my tongue in the last few because I could have raised questions of privilege because my rights were being really st stomped on. The opportunity for open debate did not exist. And so um, I could have sent that signal. I could have been disruptive, but I wasn't really focused anything controversial with the content of the meeting. So as a member of the assembly, as a club officer participating in district council meeting, I didn't jump in. But that doesn't mean I might not in the future, because my question, you know, my rights are being stampled on, uh, tromped on by the use of tools like Zoom, and the inability for myself to put up my hand to be recognized and the ability for me to participate in de in debate. I have to be very, very careful when we use these new tools that we're not stomping on the rights of, of the assembly. Right of reach assessed, which is uh, really just um, a, a temporary pause and a very, very interesting tactical tool, motion to adjourn or fixed time to adjourn, which is like a, a ticking time bomb. Nine o'clock, poof, the meeting's over. And there's no, no discussion, no debate, because you've already done that. You, you set a motion to adjourn the meeting at a specific time, and all it has, someone has to do is call orders of the day if you're beyond that time, and the meeting's over. The meeting's over. It's all it is. Point of order, this is where you're bringing information to the attention of the chair, point of information, maybe to the assembly, you know, financial information that's relevant to the discussion at hand. These are useful tools. And um, now, uh, I like to call orders of, like, I, I like to call for the vote. Um, this is my favorite activity when I'm at a district council meeting because I hear debate and some for, some against, some for, some against, some for. And I hear people, the second I hear someone repeating themselves, immediately raise my hand as if I'm participating in the debate and uh, the chair recognizes me, call the question, which means let's vote. Let's vote. I don't, I don't want to hear the same thing over and over again. Let's vote. I'm a member of the assembly. I want to vote. So there can be suspension of the rules. Sometimes informal discussion is required. Objection to consideration of the question. Very interesting tactical tool we'll explore in future meetings. Division of the question is a, a good way to handle voting. Consideration by paragraph. I've done this where we were passing a new set of bylaws for an organization and uh, lots of material to cover. And so rather than try and pass the whole thing as one package, which would not work because there were some money issues involved, we did it pair by paragraph by paragraph. And the way I recommended to the chair was people vote for it, against it, or refer it to committee. And 95% of the constitution was adopted with two thirds approval. There was a few sections sent to the committee that involved money, the membership fees, which I found very funny. Um, so there we are. Motion to reconsider just because you passed something last week doesn't mean you can't reconsider it this week. If this passes, the motion that's involved goes back to the uh, uh, open debate stage um, before voting. Motion to rescind, she's a gone, she's over. Whatever the motion was, if it's rescinded, it's gone. Now there is an order of precedence, which is laid out in the chart of accounts, which I made available to you uh, today. And in this, um, there is a certain ranking where some uh, motions will take on a greater importance than others. Notice the motion to adjourn is right up there, right up there. And so it's a great tactical tool. And when I uh, belong to uh, Plains Toastmasters with, Helgi Goodman and, and Russ Duffy and then these, these characters that, you know, would crack open Robert's Rules of Order at the business meeting. Um, I, I, I just watched with fascination that they have each outmaneuvered each other um, using this, this uh, staircase, if you will. And so the, the main motion, as you can see, is at the bottom of the tier and can be directly impacted by privileged and subsidiary motions that impact on that main motion, including things like raising a question of privilege. See how high that's ranked. And so if you as an individual feel that your rights are being stamped upon, then um, 
you will be very, very able to to voice those concerns and the chair must pay attention to any matter that's a question of privilege cannot be just ignored. So other considerations. Um, members can abstain. Thank you for being here today. Your constituting quorum, thank you. If you want to abstain, that is your right. Nothing more needs to be said. You cannot compel people to vote. If they want to abstain, that's their right. Presiding officers in many constitutions are given the right to break ties. Presiding officers cannot make motions, but there's nothing wrong with lobbying for them. Ladies and gentlemen, could I have a motion that approves our agenda? I haven't made that motion. John, are you going to make a motion that we adopt the agenda? Yes, I am, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Is there a seconder for the motion? Seconder? We really need a seconder. Thank you, uh, Janice, for seconding the motion. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a motion on the floor um, to adopt the agenda as circulated. Any debate, any debate, any debate? And I, I, I call things three times. Are we ready for a vote? Are we ready for a vote? Ready for a vote? Let's vote. All in favor? I declare the motion to adopt the agenda as circulated as approved. Madam Secretary, please enter into the record. Now, one new concept that has come into play is the concept of receiving reports. And this is very important in that no one is approving or um, debating uh, a report once it's written but you're formally entering into the record. So a motion to receive report, this is, falls in the category of a standing rule because it's not formally part of Robert's Rules of Order and actually is something comes from Kerr and King, but very, very, very useful for making a meeting efficient in that you call upon someone, they make a report, they give a little aura report, one or two minutes, the report is attached to the minutes and goes into the record. It can be a very comprehensive report great way of handling a financial report because once a financial report is audited you really can't change it there's no ability to you know uh, make a motion for example that um, the uh, office supplies are too high well that may be fine it doesn't change the fact that money spent but if you receive the financial report then there's no need to waste time talking about office supplies that are too high that's really something for an approval of a budget for the future, but you can't change what's happened in the past. Meeting minutes really are just a list of the motions passed or not approved. You can put the name of the person who made the motion, you can put the person who seconded the motion as part of that record, but that's all that needs to be put in the minutes. No need to keep track of who said what, when, when. That's not what minutes are for. They're for the record. And so this applies to um, any organization, you know, um, especially ones that have corporate governance. And really, um, there's meetings of shareholders, meetings of uh, directors, meetings of officers. All these meetings can be run using Robert's Rules of Order. So here is the chart of motions that has been made available and one that we can use uh, to um, run a meeting. Now, what I'd like to do at this stage is I'm going to uh, pick upon a few of the participants. And I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna start uh, with um, Karen. Karen, I'd like you to make a motion. And the motion that I'd like you to make is uh, a motion that Christmas Day should be mer merged with New Year's Eve. And I want you to speak for the motion, passionately. And next, I'm going to call upon Lorna. I'm going to ask her to speak against the motion. And I'm going to call upon Marta 
if she's available, to rise on a question of uh, order or privilege, or and, and it can be anything. Um, and if you want to just talk about um, not issues that have nothing to do with, with the issue at all. And so, um, and I need to have someone second the motion, it can be anyone. So I'm going to um, just oh, stop my share. And go into a gallery view. And so I'm going to call to order this meeting. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I call this meeting to order. We have uh, an important meeting today uh, with the uh, weekend Word Masters uh, Toastmasters Club. And I'd like to call upon anyone that would like to make a motion. Is there anyone that wishes to make a motion? Chair recognizes uh, Karen Tobert. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So at this time of year, I feel like there's there's so many uh, conflicting priorities and so much going on. And the conundrum of trying to have hybrid meetings and, and uh, Zoom meetings that I really feel impelled to put forward my motion. Uh, and so I move that that Toastmasters International combine to Christmas Day with New Year's Eve. And then there is no discrimination. There is, oh, I guess I'm speaking to it. I move that Toastmasters International combine Christmas Day with New Year's Eve as an ongoing celebration. Thank you, Karen. Fellow Toastmasters, we have a motion that's before us. The motion is that Toastmasters International should recognize the uh, merger of Christmas Day with New Year's Eve. Now, of course, we can't compel them, so I'd, I'd like to go back to the mover of the motion. Can we add the words um, to your main motion before we call for a seconder that um, we would like to recommend to Toastmasters, because of course we can't compel them. We don't have the authority. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, we, <laughs> so I have ADHD. I have a short attention span. So yes, so, insert what you said there. <laughs> you accept, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the motion before us is simple, to recommend to Toastmasters International that the holiday of Christmas day be merged with uh, New Year's Eve the motion is before the floor. Is there a seconder for this motion? The chair recognizes Dave. Dave has seconded the motion. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a motion before the floor. It has been made and seconded. The motion is that we're going to recommend to Toastmasters International that the holiday of Christmas Day be merged with New Year's Eve. Now, I'm, I'm now going to go back to Karen, who has made the motion to speak on its behalf. Karen, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I, I am I'm putting forth this motion because of the conflicting, conflicting uh, pulls on people's time and energies and I and the non-exclusive non-inclusivity of having segregated events. So I, I believe that this would help to bring everybody of all cultures and all religions and all faiths or non-faiths together in, in just kind of the uh, spirit of humanity and, uh, and festivity of the, of the season as a whole and would warm, us, warm our hearts at winter. So that's thank, my speaking. Thank you very much. Motion. Thank you. Is there any discussion against the motion? Is there any discussion? against the motion. Yes. Chair recognizes yes. uh, Laura I Arnold. would like Chair recognizes Laura Arnold, yes. you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, our society has uh, put a whole lot of focus to make this a whole week of uh, celebrating and uh, opportunities for many groups and families to get together. So putting the two holidays together would take away from the opportunities to build connections. So I 
believe that we should just take the whole week off, not condense it down to one mad two-day night. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we've heard discussion for the motion. Uh, we've heard discussion against the motion. Is there any more discussion? Is there any more discussion? Is there any more discussion? Hearing no more discussion, are we ready to vote? Are we ready to vote? I think we're ready to vote. Hearing that uh, there's no more discussion and that we're ready to vote, I'd like to call upon everyone wanting to uh, accept the vote. And the, we're voting for a recommendation to Toastmasters International that the Christmas holiday be merged with New Year's Eve. That's the motion, motion we're voting for. The implications of this motion is, should it be adopted by Toastmasters International, we will have one holiday, not two. And so uh, with, with that, I'd like to now call upon the vote. All those in favor, please raise your left hand. All against, please raise your right hand. Ladies and gentlemen, I declare the motion failed. So Madam Secretary, we should enter into the record. A motion was made. Uh, to merge the, make a recommendation to Toastmasters International to merge the Christmas holiday with the New Year's Eve holiday, but unfortunately the motion failed. Hearing no business, I'm now going to call to adjourn the meeting. Meeting adjourned. So there we have it. Now I want to compliment Karen because she took huge advantage of the right when she was recognized to do a preamble to support her motion. She lobbied once. Then I had to go back to her to speak on behalf of the mo motion. She lobbied a second time. That's the political aspect of this. But you can see that we opened the floor for the discussion. The rights of the minority uh, were heard, but the right of the majority to, to make a decision was also equally practiced. So this is the first in a series of five workshops. We will be exploring a lot of these tools in greater detail, but today's session was all about introducing to you the foundation tools that we will be working with in parliamentary process. I'd like to thank our guest speaker and a big round of applause for Randall Edge. You 